Pastor Eddie, I was still writing my sermon. <laughs> no, that's not really true, but I wasn't quite ready. That's good. Thank you, Will. And group, y'all have a name? Just group. Okay. 945 Praise Team. Well, thank you so much. That was good. Good to see the young people up there in the balcony. Well, I thank you for coming. What a good crowd we have tonight. I'm so glad you're here. You know, when I was a young preacher, there were over 600 Southern Baptist evangelists. Today, there are less than 100 Southern Baptist evangelists because so many churches don't have revival anymore. And one reason churches don't have revival is because they just don't ever seem to be able to find the time. Because there's always something going on, you know. There's football, and there's basketball, and there's National Potato Week. And, and, <laughs> and, and we've had our, car, our, what do you call them? Things that take away us. This week, we had the Super Bowl last night. Now, tomorrow night, the president's going to give his State of the Union address. But now, listen. You can see it 400 times when you get home. Because <laughs> they'll play it over and over. And every time they play it over, the newspaper are going to tell you what he said. Because you're not smart enough to figure out what he said. So they have to make their $100,000 a day. So they're going to tell you what he said. And then the next news group will tell you what they said that he said. But, but so you come tomorrow night, all right? It's going to be good. Tomorrow night's going to be a great night. And uh, I have, for the last five years, every year for five years, I've been going up to Salem Baptist Church in Ainer for a revival meeting, and their pastor and first lady are here tonight, Brother Ken and Miss Robin. Y'all raise your hands there, will you? That's uh, Brother Ken Harrington and his, uh, his wife, Robin, and I love these folks. Brother Ken had lunch today with the pastor and I, and we had a great time, and it's good to see you. And then the Carls, they're here with them. And uh, Are there anybody else from Salem here tonight? I know some more are coming tomorrow night, but thank you for coming, Brother Ken. I, you know how much I love you. Well, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 15. I am sure enjoying your pastor. I tell you, he's a good guy, isn't he? Your pastor's all right. Now, his wife, Miss Terry, her mom and daddy here tonight, and I love your pastor and his wife as well. We're having a good time together. And Mark, I like you too, and your wife. <laughs> Uh, I like Mark. Mark's, I really like Mark when he's sober. I mean, he really is. Yeah. <laughs> One of your committee members called me and asked me when y'all were considering him as your staff member. They, somebody, I don't remember who it was, called me and asked me about him. And I said, oh, he's wonderful. He's a great musician. And, and they said, well, what are his faults? I said, well, when he gets real drunk, he will cuss a little. <laughs> All right, Matthew chapter 15, and we're going to begin reading in verse 29. Matthew 15, 29, if you have found it, say amen. amen. And Jesus departed from thence, and came nigh into the Sea of Galilee, and went up into a mountain, and sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them, insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. Now verse 29 says, and he departed from thence. Now let me tell you where he had been. When you read the New Testament, Jesus and his disciples only left what we would call the Holy Land. They only left it one time. And when they left it, they went north to the country of Phoenicia. And Phoenicia was considered by the Jews to be an unclean country. The cities of Tyre and Sidon were up there in Phoenicia, and they were, it was an ungodly place. And no Jew would ever, ever go up into Phoenicia. 
If a Jew went up into Phoenicia, it meant that he or she would be defiled and they could not ever again go into the temple at Jerusalem. That's how they considered Phoenicia. It was such a corruptive place. It was such an ungodly place. It was an unclean place. And so Jews never, never went up to Phoenicia. But Jesus and the 12 disciples went up there because there was a lady up there that needed Jesus desperately. And he always goes where people need him. And so they had gone up into Phoenicia. But now the Bible says they departed from thence and they come back. And the gospel of Matthew says they came to the Sea of Galilee, but the Gospel of Mark tells us that when they got to the Sea of Galilee, they got into a boat and went down to the southern part of the Sea of Galilee. Now, the reason that's important is this. Most of the ministry that Jesus had done around the Sea of Galilee was up in the northern part between the cities of Capernaum and Bethsaida. Most of the ministry of Jesus around the Sea of Galilee was up there in the northern part. And the people up there were Jehovah worshipers. They were, they were people out of Jewish culture and Jewish backgrounds. And, and so they were very familiar with, with the Jewish uh, uh, law and the, and the Jewish religion. Well, but Mark says they go down to the southern part of the Sea of Galilee. Now, that was not an area that was known for Jehovah worship. As a matter of fact, Jehovah worship was foreign to them down there. That part of the Sea of Galilee area had been greatly dominated by Greek culture. And the people down there, oh, they were very religious, but they were pagans in their religion. They worshipped gods that didn't even exist. They worshipped the Greek gods like Zeus and Aphrodite and Mercury and Jupiter and Apollos and all of those Greek gods. Oh, they were very faithful to worship those, those false gods, those Greek gods, but I want to tell you it was for nothing. It was for nothing. God himself is never impressed with false worship. And so all of these people were worshiping all these false gods, and they had no allegiance to the God of Israel. They had no loyalty to the God of Israel. And as a matter of fact, they didn't even know very much about the God of Israel because they were very separated from the northern part and the southern part. And so Jesus goes down to the area where all of these people live that have been greatly influenced by that Greek culture that worshiped all those false gods. Well, word got out that Jesus was there. Now, at this point in the life of Jesus, when you come to the middle of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus' popularity is at an all-time high. Everybody knows about him. Even down in that part of the area where they did not have any allegiance to the God of Israel, they still had heard about Jesus. And at this point, Jesus was known primarily for being the healer. That was the high part of his reputation. He heals people. He makes blind people to see and cripple people to walk and dumb people to speak. He raises people from the dead. And so they knew him as the healer. And when they heard that Jesus, the healer, had now come down into their area, and he was up on a mountaintop, they began to look for him. And the Bible says, great multitude. Now, when you, in the New Testament, when you see that word, those two words, great multitudes, that usually means thousands of people, not tens or fifties or hundreds, but thousands of people. And so all of these people down in that part of the Sea of Galilee area, thousands and thousands of them, they began to make their way up that mountainside where they had heard that Jesus was there. And the Bible says, and all of them bring with them their loved ones or their friends or their associates, some of them were lame, some of them were blind, some of them were dumb, some of them were maimed and other things. But you can just see all of these thousands and thousands of people dragging sometimes and carrying sometimes and pulling sometimes all of these people with all of these ailments because they want Jesus to heal them. And so I want to share with you four things tonight from this passage of Scripture. Number one, I want you to see the condition of these people. It says that they were lame and blind, 
and dumb and maimed. Now the word lame simply means crippled. Their, their legs were attached to their bodies, but their legs were basically useless. Maybe they could walk with one foot and drag the other one if they were holding on to something. But basically, they were so crippled, their legs, even though they were attached to their body, their legs were not any value to them. And so these were people who were lame. Some of them had been born like that. Some of them had been in accidents. Some of them had been wounded in warfare. But these are people who have legs, but their legs just are not working like they're supposed to work. They're lame. They're crippled. And then it says, and the blind. Some of these people were born blind. They had never seen. They had never seen a sunrise or a sunset. They did not know the color red or the color blue or any other color. They were blind from birth. They would never seen a little girl smile. They would never seen a little boy grin. They, they knew nothing about that. They were blind from birth. But some of them are people who had a disease that settled in their eyes. And as a result of the disease, they, they had gone blind. Some of them maybe had lost their eyesight in accidents or in wartime. But, but they were now blind. And then it says, and they were, some were dumb. Now, we don't use that word much anymore because it's not come to be politically correct, I guess. And we kind of today associate dumbness with, with people who are about uh, a brick short of a load. But uh, in, in the day of the New Testament, the word dumb referred to people who could not talk. They were speechless. And so these were people who, who could not whisper a prayer. They could not sing a song. They could not gutter out anything. They were just absolutely speechless. They were dumb. And then maimed. Now, you may have a version that translates that word maimed as crippled, but that's just not really accurate because lame refers to those that were crippled. The word maimed refers to people who did not have legs at all. They did not have legs. And so they were, not, they were more than just crippled. They didn't have any legs at all. Now, maybe they were born without legs, or maybe they were wounded in battle, and, and they lost their legs for some reason. But, but these are people who did not have any legs. Or maybe they didn't have any arms, or both. But their appendages were not there. They were gone for some reason. They just weren't there. And so these are the people that were brought to Jesus, and this is the condition that they were in. I mean, we're not talking about people that had a cold, or people that had a headache, or people that had a backache, or people who had problems in the sciatica, whatever that is. But we're talking about people that were extremely crippled and blind and could not speak and did not have legs and possibly even arms. That's these people. But not only do we see the condition of these people, I want you to see the location of these people. Verse 29 says that these people came, thousands of them, bringing all of these people, and the Bible says, and they cast them at Jesus' feet. Now, you may have a version that says they put them at his feet or they laid him at their, his feet, and those are not necessarily wrong, but they miss the rough, jagged truth. The word cast means to hurl or to fling. It is a picture of desperation. These are people, and they've heard that the healer is up there, and so here they come by the thousands, bringing all of these people with all of these conditions, and they look around and they see everybody else coming up the mountain, and so they get up there as fast as they can, and they just hurl them at the feet of Jesus. You see, these are desperate people. These are people who, they, they, they have spent everything they have trying to get help for these people. Some of these blind people are the mothers or the children of some of these folks bringing them up there. Some of these maimed people are the daddies or the mothers of some of these who are bringing them up there. And so these people are desperate. And they've done everything they know to do, tried everything they know to try. And now the healer is here. And so they come as fast as they can, bringing all of these desperate people and they cast them, they fling them at the feet of Jesus. You know, most of the time, we don't really like to hang out around people's feet, do we? 
I, you know, sometimes we'll say, man, today I sat at the feet of a great teacher, but you really didn't. Or I sat at the feet of a great preacher, but you really didn't. We don't like to hang out around people's feet. There's just something not, I heard about a fellow the other day that they said he has a foot fetish. I don't even know what that is. I hope it's not dirty. But whatever it is, I'm telling you, I don't have one. I care nothing about people's feet. You can powder them. You can perfume them. You can paint all kind of colors on your toenail. I'm just not a foot guy. All right. <laughs> Did you know, though, the Bible says more about the feet of Jesus than it does about any other part of his body? The Bible talks about the eyes of Jesus. The Bible talks about the lips of Jesus. The Bible talks about the hands of Jesus. The Bible even talks about the mind of Jesus. But the Bible says more about the feet of Jesus than it does all the other parts of his body put together. Now that's interesting, isn't it? For example, his feet, in the Bible, his feet are called bruised feet. Back in the book of Genesis, chapters 1 and 2, we find Adam and Eve placed into the Garden of Eden, the most beautiful environment you could imagine. I mean, everything was beautiful. There were never any storms there. There were never any freezing nights. There were never any hot burning days. It was a perfect environment. The temperature was always just right. There were not any thorns there. There were not any thistles there. I mean, it was absolutely beautiful in the Garden of Eden. And everything worked in perfect harmony. But then you come to Genesis 3, which is the darkest, darkest chapter in all the Bible. Because the devil comes into the Garden of Eden, that beautiful place that God had made for Adam and Eve. And he approaches Eve and he, he begins to question her. Uh, you see, God had told Adam and Eve this. In the Garden of Eden, there were all kinds of fruit trees. I mean, the garden was big and the garden was full. I mean, full of fruit trees. And every one of those fruit trees bore fruit all year long. And God said, listen, you can go to any tree you want to go to. You can pick as much fruit as you want to pick. You can eat as much fruit as you want to eat. So just help yourself. There will never be a shortage. Every time you pick one, I'll row another one. You just help yourself. There's plenty, plenty, plenty. You can eat of any tree in the garden, any of them except one. There's one tree right in the middle of the garden, and you must not eat of that tree. Because if you eat of that tree, in the day you eat thereof, you're going to die. That's what God said. And so here comes the devil in the form of a serpent, and he comes to Eve, and he says to her, now, now what did God say? And she said, well, God said that he's placed us here in the Garden of Eden, and he's surrounded us with all kinds of fruit trees, and, and we can go to any tree we want to go to. We can pull as much fruit as we want to pull, eat as much fruit as we want to eat, and just enjoy ourselves forever. But there's one tree in the middle of the garden. God said, you cannot eat of that tree, because if you do, you're going to die. And the devil says, that's not true. God lied to you. God told you a lie. You can eat of that tree. As a matter of fact, when you eat the fruit of that tree, you're going to be as smart as God is. And when you eat the fruit of that tree, you're going to know everything God knows. As a matter of fact, if you eat the fruit of that tree, you're going to become a God yourself. And you won't need God anymore. You'll be your own God. God told you a lie. God said you're going to die. But I'm telling you, you're not going to die. And so Eve, having been deceived by the devil, she reaches, she pulls a piece of the fruit off that forbidden tree, and she eats it. And then Adam comes. And Adam says, Eve, what have you done? Oh, this, this serpent told me that if I ate the fruit of that tree, I'm not going to die. I'm going to be God. And so I did. And, and so Adam, Adam was not deceived according to the New Testament. Eve was deceived, but Adam was not deceived. Adam willfully and disobeyed God. He lifted his fist of rebellion in the face of God. And he reached out and took a piece of fruit from that forbidden tree. And he ate it. And you know what? They didn't die. 
God said, in the day you eat thereof, you're going to die. And the devil said, no, go ahead and eat it. You're not going to die. And so they ate it and they didn't die. It looks like God lied and the devil told the truth. But that's impossible. God cannot lie and the devil never tells the truth. He can't do it. Part of them did die the minute they disobeyed God. You see, when God made Adam and Eve, God gave them a body that related to a physical world. Your body tells you when it's hot. Your body tells you when it's cold. Your body relates you to this physical world. And he also gave them a soul. Your soul relates you to a psychological world. As a matter of fact, the word psychology comes from the Greek word suke, which means soul. And so God gave them a soul so they could relate to each other. But then when God created Adam and Eve, not only did they have a body that related them to a physical world and a soul that related them to a psychological world, God gave them a spirit that related them to a spiritual world. They knew that the Lord through their spirit that he had given them when he made them. And when they disobeyed God, when they ate the fruit of that tree, their bodies did not die and their soul did not die. But the spiritual part of them died the minute they disobeyed God. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus didn't get it. He said, am I supposed to go find my poor old mother? And she might have been dead for all I know. Am I supposed to go find my poor old mother and through some process of biological reversal, am I supposed to re-enter the body of my mother and be born? I'm sure Jesus chuckled at that. Nicodemus, you and I are not even on the same wavelength. You're talking about being born of a woman. I'm talking about being born of God. You're talking about being born of the flesh. I'm talking about being born of the Spirit. Your soul did not die. Your body did not die. But Adam and Eve, your spirit died just like God said it would. And then God comes into the garden. And He knows. He knows. He always knows when something is amiss. And he says, Adam, what have you done? And Adam said, well, Lord, uh, 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 well, sir, uh, it's not me. It's that woman you gave me. And God said, Eve, what have you done? And she said, well, sir, uh, uh, well, it's not me. It's that serpent that you made. You see, one of the signs of a dead spirit is we never will accept personal responsibility for our own sinfulness. We like to blame it on other people things or people. We blame our mother. We blame our father. We blame society. We blame the government. We blame this person. We blame the hypocrites in the church. I am like I am, not because I'm a sinful person, but because the way I've been treated by so many people. That excuse never makes it with God. God will never hold anybody accountable for your sin but you. And God then speaks to the serpent and he said, uh, I know what you've done. You've deceived Eve and you've brought Adam to a point of rebellion in his life against me. But I want to tell you something, Satan. Genesis 3.15 One day, one day there's going to come a man and he's going to come in an unusual way. He's coming through the seed of a woman. Now listen, Biology 101. Women do not have seed. Women have never had seed. Women have eggs. Men have seed. And God said there's going to come one day through the seed of a woman. It speaks of a one who is going to be born without the agency of a human father. There's going to come one that is going to be born of a virgin. And you're going to bruise his heel. 
And that speaks of Jesus hanging upon the cross when they drove the nails in his hands and in his feet. The devil bruised the heel of the Son of God. But God said there in Genesis 3.15, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. And that happened on the day of resurrection. When Jesus Christ came out of the tomb, he came out swinging. And he drove the head of the devil in the ground. I'm telling you, I've heard preachers say, the devil is alive and well on planet earth. He may be alive, but he's not well. He's got a serious wound in his head. The feet of Jesus bruised feet. The feet of Jesus were beautiful feet. In Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah was prophesying about the coming of the Messiah. And he said, how beautiful are the feet of them that proclaim glad tidings. The Apostle Paul took that out of Isaiah 52 and put it over in Romans chapter 10. And he said it like this, how beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel. And I want to tell you, beloved, the greatest gospel preacher who ever lived was Jesus. The greatest gospel preacher was not Mordecai Ham. The greatest gospel preacher was not Billy Graham and not Billy Sunday. The greatest gospel preacher who ever lived was Mordecai Ham. Uh, was Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has beautiful feet. The preacher, the preacher of the gospel. His feet are beautiful feet. Now, I'll tell you something else about the feet of Jesus. His feet are beloved feet. Beloved feet. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus has been invited to go to the house of a man by the name of Simon. Simon was a Pharisee. And Simon did not invite Jesus to come to his house for supper because Simon loved Jesus. Oh no, Simon hated Jesus. And Simon did not invite Jesus to come because he wanted to get to know him better. No, no, he wanted to find some dirt on him. He was doing everything he could to discredit Jesus and embarrass him. And when Jesus got into that house, not only was Simon there, but all of his Pharisee buddies were there with him. All this bunch of old religionists, these guys who were just professional religious guy and they were there and they were looking at Jesus through critical eyes and they were listening to him with critical ears and they wanted to find something on him aha uh-huh, we got it now we're going to tell everybody but before Jesus went into the room up the street there was a woman and the gospel of Luke says she was a sinner And there's no doubt, there's no doubt in the gospel what kind of a sinner she was. She wasn't someone that swiped grapes at Kroger's grocery store. She was a harlot, and she was not a temple harlot, uh, but she was a street-walking prostitute. She would sell her body for sexual favors for any man who would pay her price. But earlier that day, Jesus had done something in that woman's life. He had looked at her. All other men that ever dealt with her used her her and abused her and looked down their noses at her but Jesus loved her and Jesus forgave her and Jesus saved her and gave her a brand new life and when she saw when she saw Jesus going into that house of Simon the Pharisee she didn't wait for an invitation she just ran as fast as she could and she walked in all of those Pharisees and Jesus they were all sitting down they didn't sit at tables and chairs they sat on the floor and they were all sitting down in their feet or behind them and she doesn't say anything to Simon she doesn't say anything to those Pharisees she goes to the feet of Jesus and I tell you when she walked into that house with Simon and all those other Pharisees you could just hear the "Ah." they couldn't believe that a woman like that an old street walker a whore they couldn't believe that she would come into the house of men of God no no they weren't men of God they were hypocrites they were fakers they were pretenders but they would have never had anything to do with a woman like that at least not when they were all together probably those men had gone to her in the shadows of night and done business with her But she ignores them. She pays them no attention. She goes right there to the feet of Jesus. And the Bible says she began to weep. Not little tears trickling down. But buckets of tears falling. And they fell on the feet of Jesus. And she washed his feet with her tears and then she let down her hair and she dried his feet with her hair and then the Bible says and she began to kiss his feet and kiss them over and over and over and over. She was loving. 
the feet of Jesus. His feet were beloved feet. In John chapter 12, Jesus goes into the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. In chapter 11, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. I promise you he'd been dead. Not only was he dead, he was stinking dead. They said he stinketh by now, and he'd been in the grave for days already beginning to deteriorate. And Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And now he goes to the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And Martha, bless her sweetheart, she's such a hostess and such a worker. She's in the kitchen and she's rattling the pots and the pans and setting the table and all that stuff. But Mary, she's there at the feet of Jesus, loving his feet. And the Bible says she, she takes some expensive, fragrant ointment. Oh, it was so expensive. And she dips her hand down into that ointment and she begins to rub that on the feet of Jesus and the fragrance fills the room and the feet of Jesus are being anointed with that expensive ointment. Oh, it's an act of love. And the Bible says Jesus, Judas was there and Judas looked at Mary and said, hey, don't you know? Don't you know you could have sold that for a lot of money and the money had been given to the poor? She rebuked. He rebuked Mary. <coughs> and then Jesus rebuked Judas. He said, shut up. If you want to help the poor, go help them. They'll always be here. I won't. This woman is loving my feet. His feet were bruised feet. His feet were beautiful feet. His feet were beloved feet. His feet were also blessing feet. In Mark chapter 5, there's a man by the name of Jairus. And the Bible says Jairus was a ruler of one of the synagogues. And you have to understand, these rulers of the synagogues, they'd already banded together and decided they weren't going to have anything to do with Jesus because Jesus was turning their little apple carts upside down. He was exposing them as frauds, many of them. And so they didn't want anything to do with Jesus. But Jairus had a special problem. He had a little 12-year-old girl, a 7th grade girl. A little 12-year-old girl. And she was dying. And he loved her with all of his heart. She was a daddy's girl, and he was a girl's daddy. And I mean, she was the apple of his eye, but she was dying right before him. And he'd done everything he knew to do. He'd already spent as much as he could on doctors, and they couldn't help her. They didn't know what was wrong with her, but she was dying. And so he forgets all about political correctness. He puts all of that junk aside because he knows there's only one person that can help my little girl. And he heads out to find Jesus. And he finds, hey, when you seek him, you'll find him. Amen. He's looking for Jesus and he finds him. And the Bible says, and he fell at Jesus' feet. Fell at his feet. And he said, Jesus, I have a little girl. She's just 12. And I can't even tell you how much I love her. And she's dying. Would you please come to my house? And make my little girl well. Jesus said I will. I will. And off they go. Well before they get there the little girl dies. And Jesus when they get to the house. Jesus goes back into the room. Where that dead body of that little 12 year old girl. Is laying on the bed. Those little eyes that once sparkled are now closed. Those lips that once sang little songs are now sealed. Those hands that once made mud pies and played with rag dolls are now stilled. And those legs that used to run and dance and play are now motionless. And the Bible said Jesus walks over. He reaches out and he takes her by the hand. And I want to tell you when the warm, vibrant hand of the Son of God reaches down and takes the cold, dead hand of humanity, something is going to happen. And Jesus said, little girl, I say unto thee, arise. And she arose. Now that was the miracle. But hear me, the blessing, the blessing didn't happen there in that room. The blessing took place when Jairus was at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus said, I will. In Mark chapter 7, while Jesus was up there in Phoenicia, I told you why he went up there, there was a woman that needed him. While Jesus was up there in Phoenicia, the Bible says a woman, a Canaanite woman, she wasn't a Christian, she wasn't a Jew, but she had heard about Jesus. And when she heard that he had come into their place, I mean, she made her way to him lickety-split. 
And she finds him, and the Bible said, and she fell at his feet. And she said, Jesus, I have a little girl, just a little girl. But my little girl's not like other little girls. She doesn't run, she doesn't play, she doesn't sing little songs. My, my little girl just sits in the house. She never smiles, she never laughs. She's got a vicious temper. And oh, Jesus, she's demon-possessed. My little girl is demon-possessed. Now, if you want to know how wicked and hellish and ungodly the devil is, to think that he would send one of his demons to indwell the body of a sweet little girl. But he did, and he still does. And there she is at the feet of Jesus, and she says, Jesus, will you make my little girl well? Will you cast that demon out? Will you make my little girl like other little girls? Jesus said, it's done. It's done. The lady gets up. She makes her way home. Takes her a day to get home. And when she gets there, she can't believe what she sees. Her little girl's out there playing with other little girls, just singing and dancing and rooting around the rosy and whatever girls of that time did. I mean, she's having herself a good old high time. And the lady says, what time did that happen in my little girl's life? And they said, oh, at such such time yesterday. And it was the very time that she was at the feet of Jesus getting the blessing. You see, his feet are bruised feet. His feet are beautiful feet. His feet are beloved feet, and his feet are blessing feet. But I'll tell you another thing. His feet are brass feet. In Revelation chapter 1, John is out on the Isle of Patmos. He's 100 years old. He had started following Jesus when he was a teenage boy. John was the youngest of all of the apostles. But now he's no longer a teenage boy. He's not a middle-aged person. He's not even a senior adult. He's a hundred years old. And they've put him out there on the island of Patmos because he wouldn't stop preaching. And people got tired of it. That old man is always harping and always preaching and always talking about Jesus. And we're sick of it. And so they say to the government officials, you get rid of him. You make him stop. And so they called John in and said, John, you're making people upset. Nobody wants to hear about that stuff anymore. It happened a long time ago. You better forget it. And if you don't stop preaching, we're going to put you out on an island all by yourself. And John, you're 100 years old. You're an old man. You need people to help you to take care of you. Well, John didn't stop preaching. He kept on. And the government didn't back down. They took that old man, put him out there on an island, the island of Patmos, all by himself. And he wasn't out there on a vacation. He was out there being punished. In Revelation chapter 1, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Hey, that's a good way to be on the Lord's day, amen? A lot of people in the flesh on the Lord's day. But John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And he said, I heard a voice behind me. Oh, he said it was a loud voice, a sharp voice, a penetrating voice. He said it was like a strong, mighty trumpet. And that voice said, I'm Alpha Omega, the first and the last. John knew who that was. I know who that was. You know who that was. That's Jesus. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And John said, and I turned to see the voice. That's interesting, isn't it? I turned to see the voice. And he said, when I saw him at first glimpse, I recognized it was the Son of Man. John knew who the Son of Man was. I know who the Son of Man is. You know who the Son of Man is. In the New Testament, Jesus is called Master, Savior, Lord, Redeemer, King. But, uh, the, but the title that Jesus himself used more than any other to describe himself is Son of Man. John knew who he was. And then John says, and I looked at his face. His hair was white like wool. His eyes were like pools of fire. Proceeding out of his mouth was a sharp two-edged sword. And then he said, I looked at his feet. And his feet were like brass that had been burned in a fire. Those are the judgment feet of the Lord Jesus, trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. And beloved, you let me tell you this. If you don't make your way to the feet of Jesus and receive the blessing of eternal salvation, if you reject that, then one day you will be trampled under the judgment feet of brass of the Lord Jesus. His feet 
Oh, his feet are bruised feet and beautiful feet and beloved feet and blessing feet and brass feet. And they cast them, they hurl them at the feet of Jesus. And so we see the condition of the people and the location of the people. But now thirdly, the demonstration of Jesus. Look at the last three words of verse 30. He healed them. What sublime simplicity. There's no fanfare. There's no pomp and circumstance. There are no blasting of trumpets. The windows of heaven do not open. Heavenly choirs do not sing. It just says, He healed them. He healed them. The blind were seeing. The deaf were hearing, the dumb were speaking, and those that were maimed, the Bible said, they were made whole, immediately made whole. How could that be? Because Jesus showed up. <coughs> and now don't get mad with me and don't get on those blogs and run me down. I hate that stuff. But I want to tell you, when Jesus shows up, usually he shows out. I mean, he doesn't go just to be one of the bunch. When Jesus shows up, usually he shows out. And the Bible said, and he healed them. He didn't call anybody. I mean, all the blind were seeing, all the deaf were hearing, all the dumb were speaking, all the maimed were whole. He healed every one of them. And the people wondered. They were amazed at what they were witnessing and seeing. All of these healings. What a wonderful Savior we serve. Hey, you want to talk about Buddha? I'll talk to you about Buddha. You want to talk about Muhammad? We can talk all night long about Muhammad. You want to talk about Confucius? We'll talk about Confucius. But I want to tell you, they all fade into total insignificance compared to the person of Jesus Christ. There's not anybody like him. Nobody like him. One last thing, and I'll be through. The little boy said, Daddy, won't he ever get through? Son, he's been through. He just won't quit. <laughs> well, I'm fixing to quit. All right, we're coming into the landing now. We see the condition of the people and the location of the people and the demonstration of Jesus but now I want you to see the celebration that followed the last phrase of verse 31 says and they glorified the God of Israel now remember who these people were they didn't know anything about the God of Israel they had no loyalty to the God of Israel they worshiped Zeus and Aphrodite and Apollos and Mercury and Jupiter and all of those Greek gods but now they're praising the God of Israel what happened to them I'll tell you what happened to a bunch of them they got saved you know when people get saved they want to praise the Lord I don't know I don't have any explanation for these folks that claim to be saved and they don't ever come to church and I'm not talking about people that are in the hospitals or, you know, on deathbeds. But I'm telling you, if somebody's saved, they want to come and praise God with other believers. And that's just part of it. And so they, they, they begin to praise the God of Israel. One of my favorite preachers was Warren Wiersbe. I preached several times with Warren in Bible conferences across America. And, well, what a great preacher and expositor he, he was. And, and you, many of you have got his little books, that little B-series, Be This, Be That, Be That, you know, most of the books of the Bible and commentaries. Wonderful man. Warren Wiersbe says that every preacher ought to have a Holy Spirit-enlivened imagination. And through my ministry, I have tried to ask the Spirit of God to give me an enlivened imagination. And so when I look at what happened here in Matthew 15 on that day, when Jesus healed all these hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people, I wish I'd have been there to see it. Now, there are some things in the Bible, I'm glad I wasn't there to see it. I'm just telling you, but I'd like to have been there that day. And in my imagination, I'd like to see no wolf blitzer there. 
from CNN News. You know that old hairy guy with looks like a goat, you know? Old Wolf Blitzer. I'd like to have been there that day, and I'd like to have seen Wolf there. And Wolf, I can just see him. Wolf goes up to some lady, and he says, Ma'am, I, I've known you for quite a while, and I see you're here praising the God of Israel. I've never known you to praise the God of Israel. What's going on? And she says, Wolf, you see that old lady over there with all those kids standing around her? Wolf, that's my mother. Wolf, when I was five years old, my mother had a disease to settle in her eyes. And she went totally blind. And all of my brothers and sisters now, we've all grown up. And we've all got children. And all those little boys and girls are over there. And that old lady's my mother. Jesus came in here a while ago and he healed her and she's looking, she's seeing for the first time in years and years. You see her over there, she's looking in their ears and looking in their mouth and looking at them up and down and all around. I'm telling you, she's over there seeing all of her grandchildren for the first time. And Wolf, come here. You see that man right there? That man's name is Jesus, but I'll tell you who he is. He's the God of Israel and that's why I'm praising him. And Wolf says, wow, that's interesting. And he goes up and he finds another guy. And he says, sir, I see you're praising the God of Israel here today. Why are you doing that? Oh, well, I can tell you why I'm doing that. You see that little girl over there? Wolf, that little girl, that's my little girl. She's not but seven years old. And, little, and Wolf, when she was born, she didn't have any ability to speak. She's never sang a little song. She's never said, Daddy, I love you. She's never whispered a prayer. She's never uttered a sound. Never, never. But I brought her up here, and I put her at the feet of that man, Jesus, and he just looked down at her. I mean, he did didn't touch her. He didn't spit on her. He didn't. He just looked at her. And now, my, you see her over there. She's just a singing and a talking and a talking and a talking and a giggling. We may never get her to shut up. But hey, I'm telling you, that's why I'm praising this man. He's the God of Israel. That's why I'm praising him. And Wolf says, well, that's very interesting. Glad to know that. And he goes up to another man and he says, sir, I see you're worshiping the God of Israel today. Can you tell me why? Yes, sir, I sure can. You see that little boy over there? That little boy over there is my little boy. And when he was born, he had legs, but his legs have never, never worked. He's never been able to stand on his own. He's never taken one step. We can't even take him by the hand and him walk. His legs are totally useless. Everywhere he's ever gone, his mother or I, one, have had to pick him up in our arms and carry him. He's never taken a step. And I brought him up here today, this man right here. His name's Jesus. And I just laid him there, cast him there at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus just reached down and patted him on the leg. And all of a sudden, my little boy got up and he started jumping and running. Look at him over there. Man, he's a kicking and a jumping and a running. I may never catch him the rest of my life. But I'm telling you, that man Jesus, he did that for my little boy. You know who Jesus is, Wolf? He's the God of Israel. And that's why I'm praising him today. And you know, Wolf, he's kind of hard to command. So he goes to another guy. And he says, sir, I see you're praising the God of Israel today. Oh, yes, sir, I am. Well, will you tell me why? Oh, yeah, I'll tell you why. Well, if you see that old man over there, that's my daddy. When I was a little boy, my daddy went off to war. And he didn't come back with just a scrape or two. He didn't just get a purple heart. My daddy, when he came back from war, he'd been wounded in his legs. And the doctor said, it's either your legs or your life. And they cut both of my daddy's legs off right at the base of his trunk. And since that time, my daddy's had no legs, not any legs at all. They were gone since the war, years and years and decades ago. And now my daddy, when he goes around, he has to put his palms out, and then he scoots, and then he puts his palms out, and he scoots, and he's never taken a step. We have to pick him up to put him in a chair for, for him to sit in a chair. But today... I brought my daddy with no legs. I lifted him up in my arms. And I ran up this mountain as fast as I could. And I cast him there at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus looked down at him and just patted that little nub on either side. And, lay, and, and I'm telling you, Wolf, I saw something I wouldn't have believed if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. Out of my daddy's trunk, legs grew. And I don't mean they grew over a period of a long time. I mean they started and they didn't stop in a matter of seconds. My daddy who had not had legs for 40 years. My daddy has legs. And look at my daddy over there. My soul. He's just a kicking and doing jumping jacks and he's dancing and 
That's why I'm praising the God of Israel. Well, if you see that man, Jesus, he is the God of Israel. Now, folks, I want to tell you, no wonder the hymn writer said, Hallelujah, what a Savior. There's not anybody like Jesus. I want to ask you tonight, do you know him? I don't mean, do you know about him? Do, do you know him? I mean, deep down in your heart, do you really know him? If you know him, how much time have you spent with him today? How much time have you spent with him in the past week, the past seven days? How many times have you told him, Lord, I love you? How many times have you said, Jesus, thank you? Thank you for doing what you've done in my life. How long has it been since you just fell before him at his feet and said, Jesus, I just want to praise you. I just want to glorify you. I thank you for being who you are and for doing what I've done in my life. There are a lot of reasons why people come to the altar. Boy, last night, didn't we have a sweet time here? I mean, this altar was filled with people who came saying, Lord, I just need to touch you. I just need to touch you. Oh, it was so sweet. And I just wonder tonight, maybe there's some who would just like to come tonight and say, Lord, I'm not going to ask you for a thing. I just want to tell you I love you. I just want to tell you I love you. And I've come here before you. I don't care who sees me. I've just come tonight to say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for what you've done in my life. And Jesus, I sure do love you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I've done my best to take these little verses, open them up, and present the Lord Jesus. My soul. Lord, what a joy it is to talk about him, preach about him, sing about him. And so, Lord, tonight, uh, maybe there are some who just like to come. Maybe their heart's not heavy. Maybe it is, but Maybe they're not burdened down with baggage. Maybe it is. Maybe they're not weeping over some unsaved loved one. Maybe they are. But, but Lord, they, they, tonight they just come to your altar. Lord Jesus, I'm here tonight just to tell you I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And that's what revival is, beloved. Revival is a time when God's people fall in love with Jesus all over again. Now, there may be somebody here that needs to be saved. There might be a teenager up there in the balcony. Thank you for being here. You've been so kind. You've listened. And I appreciate your being here. Young people, are you saved tonight? Teenage guys, teenage girls, are you saved? I mean, if you died tonight, do you know you'd go to heaven? Maybe some of you need to come and be saved tonight. Jesus is here. He's right here in this house. And he'll save you tonight if you'll come ask him. I promise you, he will. And maybe there's some adults here tonight who need to be saved, or some children, whatever. You come. But if you'd just like to come to this altar and just say, Lord Jesus, I'm here to tell you I love you, then you can do that. Father, this is your invitation, and I pray you'd bring glory to yourself through.